Hello everyone and welcome to the ninth episode of the PowerShell video series. In this episode we're going to cover two very important PowerShell structures that allow you to create even more complex scripts. And throughout this video we're going to put together what is perhaps going to be the biggest thing we've ever made in the entire series. It's going to be pretty interesting. <laughs> Just before we get into that, I'd just like to say that if you are experienced in programming and know other languages very well, this episode may feel a little bit slow in places and I'm sorry about that, but I promise you there's a lot of new stuff in here as well and I'll do my best to keep this video flowing, whether you are or aren't already experienced in programming. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's dive straight into it. First, before we dive into all the new things, let's make sure we understand the script from the last episode and why exactly it works. To demonstrate this, what we're going to do is use something known as the debugger. This is a tool that lets you visually watch your PowerShell script run line by line. So what you do is you put something called a breakpoint into the code. This is a marker attached to one of the lines in the script. And what's going to happen is PowerShell is going to run the script as normal. You won't get to watch it or anything, it will just go as normal. But then as soon as it hits the line with a breakpoint, it's going to stop there and let you start watching it run step by step. Let me show you. To add a breakpoint in Visual Studio Code, if you put your mouse just over here to the left of the line numbers, you'll see a little red circle appear. And this red circle is the breakpoint. And what you do is you go to the line you want to put the breakpoint on and you click to place a breakpoint on that line. Let's put it on this line here because I don't think we really need to watch the input happening. That's not really very interesting. So we'll make it stop right here at the very first div. And now if we run PowerShell through a debugger, as soon as it hits this line, it will pause there and let us manually step through the code line by line watching it go. Let me show you. Now, as hinted at, you can't just run the script in PowerShell like normal. I can't just go run the script and have it stop at this breakpoint, because just running the script normally like this isn't running it through the special debugging tool we need. No, what we need to do is go into Visual Studio Code and go up to Run and press Start Debugging, and this will now run PowerShell through the debugger. And all the inputs and outputs go down here. So let's enter in our grade. Let's say 72. And now when it gets to this line, it stops running and it pauses here. And what I can now do is I can control PowerShell and watch it run step by step. So right now it's stopped here. And if I hover my mouse over the variables, I can look at what's in them, like so. So we can see 72 is indeed in that variable. Now let's make it continue on to the next step, onto the next line. To do this, we'll just press the down arrow here, called step into. And when we press this, what's going to happen is PowerShell is going to move onto the next step, the next line that it needs to run. So let's predict what line that's going to be. So, is this condition true? Is the input greater than or equal to 90? Well, no, it's not. We can see that it's 72. So it's not going to run the code in this if statement. And instead, when we step into, it's going to jump into the else. Now, if the value was 90 or above, it would have just run this if statement and then skipped over all the else which is what we want. No point in checking all these if it's above 90. But it wasn't, so we're doing this here to check if it was one of the other grades. Is it greater than or equal to 80? Nope, so it skips over that and goes into this else. Yet again, is it greater than or equal to 70? Well, actually, yes, it's 72. So it does run this if statement, and we print grade C. And once we've done that, we just skip over the rest of the conditions. Which is good, because if we didn't, this would end up being true, and we'd also print grade D, which was the issue we saw in the last episode. Alright, great, and this script does work. But as I mentioned in the last episode, there is a certain thing we can use to make this more readable. And that thing is called else if. And it's literally an else and an if in one. To join an else and an if together into an else if, all we do is get rid of the opening curly brace on the else here, and get rid of the closing curly brace for this else too. Sometimes it can be a little difficult to find exactly which curly brace matches up to which. And then, after we've removed that, put these two together. And there we are. This is a valid PowerShell keyword. It's an else and an if in one. And we can also merge the rest into else if. So when we're done, we'll be left with this. This is the final thing. Now, the way else if works 
is exactly the same as what we had before. Only when the if statement above failed will it check this condition. And you can chain lots of else ifs one after another. And when you do that, only when the else if above failed will it check this. So what happens is when PowerShell runs this script, it asks if the percentage is above 90%. If it is above 90%, it's going to print out grade A. And then, because these else ifs only run when this if fails, it's going to jump over all these else ifs, and we'll end up down here, which is just going to be the end of the script. So the script finishes. But, if our percentage was, say, 83%, then what's going to happen is this condition is going to be false, because it's not above 90%, which means it's then going to run this condition. And this condition will give true, so it prints B. And because this condition gave true, the rest of the else ifs aren't going to run, because these only run when the else if above them fail, and so on. Hopefully you can sort of see how else if lets you chain a bunch of conditions all together into one. And the one important thing you have to remember, which I did mention in the last episode, is when you have an else like this, that else is always attached to the if above it, right? It has to be, because that's what it does. It's the opposite of whatever if is above it. It basically becomes attached, becomes an alternative way to go, if the if above it fails. For example, I can't just write else up here on its own like this, that's going to give an error because, well, what's the else attached to? What is it the otherwise of? There's no if above it. So there always has to be an if right above the else here, and you can't put anything between them. As soon as you put something between them, you separate them. The only thing you can actually put between them is comments, since those are ignored by PowerShell. And else if is exactly the same. If you're going to add one to an if, it has to go right after that if, so it becomes attached, becomes an alternative path to try only when that first if failed. You can also put an else after an else if, and this will only run when the else if above it fails. For example, let's consider this scenario. If A is true, it's going to run this, and then jump all the way down here. If A is false and B is true, this if will fail, so it's going to run this, and then this else if will succeed, so it will run this. But if A is false and B is false, then this will fail, so it goes to this, and then this else if will fail, so it will go to the else. So you can put an else at the end of this chain of ifs and else ifs too, as a sort of, if none of these were true, do this. So in summary, we have if statements which run a block of code if a condition is true. We have else statements, which run if the if or else if above them failed. And then we have else if statements, which are just like ifs, but they only run if the if or else if above them failed. And those are the three keywords for ifs. That's it. That's the entirety of if statements. And if you're not familiar with programming, it may feel a little bit daunting with these three. But with enough practice, you can get quite good at using them. In the description, I prepared some tasks you can do to practice them. And if you're not already familiar with it from other languages, I highly recommend you pause the video, take a break, and try those out. And there are hundreds more online if you go searching for them. And after you've done that, or if you're already comfortable with these three, let's move on, shall we? Now, we are about to continue with scripting, and I'm about to introduce one more very important control flow structure for controlling how our scripts run. But just before I get to that, I'd like to introduce a new command to you called select object. Now, so far in the series, we've learned quite a lot of commands to help us process objects, like where to filter them down, or for each to get them down to just one property, or measure to measure details about them. And this command is another extremely useful command we can use for processing. Select is a very powerful command, and it allows us to do a lot of different things. It's a really flexible command. It can be used for one thing, and it can be used for another. Let's just run get help on it and see what parameters it has. So when we run get help, you can see that it has a first parameter, a skip parameter, a property parameter, and a dash unique parameter. These are the four main things it lets us do. There are some other things it can do. You can actually create custom objects with it as well. But it's really ugly when really, you could just cast a hash table to PS custom object for that. Now, I think some of these parameters might be fairly self-explanatory. And you can probably just try them out yourself. But let's take a look here. Let's get an array of objects to try it on, shall we? How about we just get all of the running processes? 
that should be good enough. And as we know, this is of course an array it gives back. Now, let's hand select this array and see what it does with different things. Let's start by trying out the dash first parameter. I'll write dash first and I'll say 5. What this does is it gives us a new array with only the first 5 items in it. So it literally just gets the first n number of items. Cool, so that's what that parameter does. We can use select dash first to get only n number of items. That might be useful for something someday. Alright, let's try out select dash skip next. Let's do something like 3. Hmm, well, that didn't really help explain what it did. Let's try it on a much smaller array. Maybe it'll be clearer what exactly that just did there. Let's make an array here with 5 items in it, 1 to 5. And then we'll give it to select and make it skip 3. Ah, interesting. Uh, just ignore the fact that I mistyped it. So it skipped over the first 3 items. So, that's what dash skip lets us do. It lets us skip over items at the beginning. Next, there's the dash unique parameter. If we give it an array with duplicates, it gets rid of the duplicates and makes sure there are no duplicates in the array. And finally, is the dash property parameter. This lets us filter an object down to just one property. Now, I know you might be thinking, wait a second, we can use for each to do that, can't we? And yes, we can, but select does things slightly differently. When you filter an object down to just one property with for each, what it does is it goes through each object one by one, grabs the value in that property, and collects all those values together. So you end up with all the objects that were in the property completely on their own, like this. This is perfect, because we have those raw objects on their own, completely separate from where they originally came from, and we can do measuring on them and such. However, select works slightly different. Unlike for each, where you're actually giving it code to run on each object, with select, you tell it the name of the property, and it itself will scan through each object and find that property. And when it does find the property, what select does is it creates a new object with just that property on it, like this. Notice the slight difference. With for each, we actually got those objects on their own, but with select, what it's done is it's made new objects with this one property on them, and then put whatever value was in here into that one property as well. The thing is, we can't do measuring on this, because there's these select objects, the object made by select, around the value. But this does work very well if you wanted to say, only export this one property to a CSV file. Let's say we had our process objects here, and we only wanted to export just this name property to a CSV file. We don't want the rest of them in the CSV file. You might think, oh, I'll just use for each to filter it down to just this property, and then I'll hand that to export CSV. But if you really think about it, this won't work. Let's export this to a CSV file and see what we get. Huh, that's interesting. So it's got a bunch of lengths. Why is that? Well, if we think about what our command has done here, we can understand why this has happened. So we took our process object and we grabbed out all the strings from the name properties of each object. And if we look at this in a diagram, this is essentially what we get out of that, right? This is our result from the for each. And what we've essentially got here, and what we give to export CSV, is an array of strings. It's just a whole bunch of strings. Now, what does export CSV do when we give it a collection of objects? Well, it goes through each object, and it writes each property within those objects to the file. That's what it does, right? If we give it an array of process objects, it goes through each property in those process objects and writes them out. And this is fine if we give it, say, an array of processes. But if we give it an array of strings, just an array of raw strings, there's nothing around them, there's no property name or anything like that, well, what's it going to do? It's going to go through each string and write all the properties in each one, because that's what it does. The only property we have in a string is the length property, so it literally just writes the length of each string. However, if we had used select, then it's a different story. With select, the result looks like this. Each string is inside, is wrapped in, if you will, this select object, with that one property on it. So when export CSV goes to export this, it goes through each of these select objects, and it saves that one property in them, which contains our string. 
so you end up with the correct output. I know it's a little hard to see at first, but that's really the difference between these two. With for each, you literally just pull out the objects, and once you've done that, there's absolutely nothing linking those objects back to where they came from. The property name they used to be in is completely gone, it's just an array of those objects. Which is great for things like measuring because, well, that's what they need, they just need to be given those objects. But sometimes you want to keep those properties as properties. You don't want to just extract the value, you want the property names to still be there in some form in the final thing. You want the objects to be wrapped around by a select object to allow that, and their select is the way to go. There's also one other reason select is useful, and that's that select can actually extract multiple properties. Again, with for each, this isn't really possible unless you create a new object yourself with multiple properties in the curly braces. But because select creates these select objects, you can actually tell it to extract multiple properties, and it will put those multiple properties on each of these objects. So I could ask for both the name and the extension, and now I'm going to get each of these objects with the name and the extension attached to them. If we look at the select command, you can actually see that the property parameter takes in an array, so we can give it multiple properties just by giving it multiple items there. And this is quite useful for things like, again, only exporting certain properties to a CSV file. Alright great, so after that little tangent, we've looked at how we can debug our scripts, we've taken a look at the select command, and at how we can use the if keywords. Now let's take a look at one more control flow structure we have in PowerShell, and this is the other very fundamental one. This is looping, and that will be the last thing for this video, before we then apply what we've learnt to make a pretty large script, which will be quite fun. So, an if statement lets you run a block of code if a condition is true. And then once it's run that block of code, it moves on to the next thing, right? Well, what if you wanted to repeat a block of code again and again, just keep doing a block of code while a condition is true? So as long as a condition is true, you're going to keep repeating a block of code. Well, you can. Introducing the other fundamental keyword, while. Using this is extremely similar to if. You just write the word while, and then in brackets put the condition, and then in curly braces, give it a block of code. And that code in the curly braces will keep on repeating again and again while the condition is true. For example, let's take a look at the following code. We put this empty string into a variable called v, and we then say that while variable v is empty, we should run the code in this block. And then inside the block, we ask the user for an input, and then put what they inputted into variable v. And what's going to happen is as long as this condition is true, every time we get to the end of this block, so every time we get here, it's going to jump back up to the top of the block again. Let's debug this and I'll show you. So, it runs this line here, and puts an empty string into variable v. Then it gets to this line, and this line is the start of the while. Now, because the string is empty, the while runs, so it goes into the block. If the string wasn't empty, the while would have just completely skipped over the block, just like an if. Which makes sense, because it runs the block while the condition is true. So if the condition wasn't true when we got there, why would it even run the block at all? But the condition is true. So we go into the block here, and we get the user to input into v. And you'll notice that if I press the next button, the debugger actually disappears. This is because PowerShell is waiting for us to enter in a value. And while it's doing that, it's not actually doing anything. Our code is stuck on this read host. Nothing is going to happen until we enter something in and it moves on from that read host. So let's enter something in. Let's just enter nothing. We'll just press enter without putting anything in. And when we do that, our code will continue running because it's no longer stuck on this. So the debugger comes back and it's going to put that empty thing we just entered into variable v. So if I look at variable v, it's got an empty string in it, just like before. We didn't really put anything new into it. But now, you'll notice it's moved on to the condition. The reason is we hit the end of the block, we hit the closing curly brace, and it's now checking if we should run it again, if we should repeat the thing in the curly braces. If the condition's true it will, if it isn't, it's going to jump over the block and carry on with whatever's after the while. And that's what the while does. Every time it gets to the end of the block, it checks the condition to decide whether it should go again. It doesn't check the condition in the middle, it doesn't check it every line, it checks it when it gets to the end. 
So, is the condition true? Yes, it is. The variable is still empty because we entered empty text, so it will run the block again. And if I keep on entering empty text like this, it will keep on trying to do this again and again. It will just keep on repeating this input prompt until I enter something that's not empty. So, if I enter in A, now the variable is not empty. So now let's see what it does. So now, it goes up here to check the condition. But you'll notice the condition is false because the variable now has A in it, it's not empty. So when we move on, it doesn't run the curly braces anymore, it jumps down after, and the loop stops running. So can you see how this loop kept on running while the condition was true? Well that's what a while loop does. Now, I have a task for you. I want you to make a program, quite similar to this, using a while loop, that asks the user for a number from 0 to 100, like a percentage. And if the user enters a number between 0 and 100, the program prints that number back to them, and it's not a problem. But if they enter a number that's not in this range, then it asks them for the number again, and it will just keep on asking them for the number until they enter it in, actually between 0 and 100. This is quite a heavy task here, so try it out and see how you do. And don't forget to cast the input, because you can't use less than or greater than on a string. And I'll give you some tips if you get stuck. Alright, my tip is you're gonna need a while loop that repeats the input again and again, just like I had here. And the condition is gonna be while the input is less than 0, or is greater than 100. That's the condition we want the while loop to repeat in. Alright, let's write it. Here we are in Visual Studio Code. Now again, just start with the first thing that comes to mind. Don't worry about trying to write it in the perfect order first try. So, the first thing that comes to my mind is we're going to need a while loop, because we're going to be repeating the input prompt again and again. So in goes a while loop. I'm not sure what the condition is going to be yet, but I do know that inside the loop, we're going to be repeatedly getting this input. So let's do that, and we'll put that into a variable called percentage. And let's not forget to cast it, since it is an integer. Now, what's the condition? Under what situation do we want to be constantly repeating this? Well, we want to keep on inputting from the user while the percentage is not between the ranges of 0 to 100. So let's put that in the while loop. While the percentage is less than 0, or the percentage is greater than 100. And now, this will keep on repeating the input again and again, so long as the input is not between 0 and 100. As soon as it is between those two, we'll stop. However, there is just one problem with this, and I solved this in the last example. When we first run this code, and it gets to this while for the first time and checks the condition, what's in percentage? When we first run the program, what do we have in percentage? Well, there's nothing in percentage, we haven't said it yet. It's empty. I know you might think it becomes zero in this case, but no, it's actually just completely empty. There's just literally nothing in the variable. It's in a state we call null, which literally just means it's completely unset. It's completely empty, we just haven't put anything in that variable. I'll talk more about the null state in a later video, but ideally, if we're going to be using this percentage variable, we'd like to have set it to something at least once, somewhere, before we try to use it. So let's just try to set it to something like, well, what should we set it to? You might think we should set it to zero, but if we set it to zero, would it even run the loop at all? If it started off as zero, is it less than zero? No, so this side is false. Is it greater than 100? No, so this side is false, so false and false in an OR is going to give us false, so the loop doesn't run. Yeah, so if we set it to 0, it will literally never even run the while loop once, and that's not very helpful, we'll never even get a chance to enter in an input. So let's set it to something that will trigger the while to run, how about minus 1? Perfect, so now this will work. Pause the video, think it through line by line so you can see how it would work, and if we run it, it will do exactly what we said it would. Alright, just before we move on to the mega project we're going to make at the end of this video, there is just one improvement we could make to this. One thing we could do is we could change this into an input, just like down here, and then make this one say try again. This is actually much better than the other way, because when it's like this, it asks you for the percentage normally, and if you enter something between 0 and 100, it skips over the loop, the code carries on, that's fine. But if you enter something outside the range, then it enters into the loop, and it says try again, 
and gets us to enter it in again. And if we do enter it in correctly there, then it leaves the loop, because when we get to the end, the condition becomes false. But if we don't enter it in again, so if we yet again enter something outside the range, then it's going to repeat again and ask us to try again. And it will keep prompting us and keep asking us to try again until we finally enter it right. So this is a much better way of doing it. Alright, now it's time for us to put together the final project for this video. We're going to make a sort of point system, like so. The way the script works is you add a bunch of people to it. And every person you add has a number of points attached to them. You can add points to people when they do something good, and you can also remove points from someone when they don't. So here's the finished thing we're going to make. This is what we see when we first start it. This is the menu, and it has the following options. The first option lets us add a person. We just select this by typing 1, and it asks us to enter the name of the person we want to add. Let's do John. And now that person has been added and we go back to the menu again. And the script will just keep on repeating this menu again and again forever. So clearly some kind of loop going on there. And let's just add one other person. Let's call them Tom. All right, great. Now we have these two people in here. And there's a bunch of things we can do. Let's first take a look at these people we've added. We can do that by choosing option four here, view all people. And we can see them here. They both start off with zero points here. And as usual, it's taken us back to the menu after. Now, let's give one of them a point, especially now that I've corrected the spelling mistake I made there. We'll just choose option 2. And then it asks us who we want to give a point to. We need to enter their name. Let's give one to John, who's actually spelt right this time. And there we are, they now have a point. And if we go in and view the people again, we can see that they now have one point now. And we can also remove points from people, like let's say Tom. So now, if we go to view them, they look like this. You could also add a feature to export all the people to CSV. And there could be a feature to view all the people with more than zero points, and all sorts of things like that. These can all be added as you want, I'll talk about that at the end. So, let's try and make this script. Let's just do a little bit of planning just before we put it together. First of all, how are we going to store? How are we going to hold on to all the people they've added so far? Well, we're obviously going to need a variable to hold on to all the people they've added and the points alongside them, but what are we going to put in that variable to hold all the people they've added? What type of object could we use to store many, many different people in memory? Well, we're going to need a collection of some sort, because the user can add any number of people, and we're going to make it so each person is an item in that collection. That's the best way to hold this kind of info. But what kind of collection should we use? An array or a hash table? Just a quick reminder, when you have an array, you literally just have a bunch of objects all put together into the one, and you can then access individual items in there by their position. And with a hash table, every smaller item has a key and a value, and you can get values by their key. Well, let's take a closer look at what exactly we need to be able to do with these people. So, we need to be able to add people to this. Alright, yeah, an array or a hash table will do that. We also need to be able to list all the people in the collection. Well, again, we could do that with either an array or a hash table. Ah! But these things need us to enter the name of a person, and they need to be able to find that person in the collection by that name and give or take a point from them. So ideally, we should use the one that lets us find an item by a key, right? Because for these, we need to be able to enter in the name of a person, and it needs to be able to find that person and add or remove a point to them. So a hash table would be ideal for that. Now, of course, we could still do this with an array. What you could do is for each the array and put an if inside the for each to check whether the current item is what we're after. And you could find that person's position using something along those lines. And there are also some methods available that will take in an array and give you the position of an item for you. The best one is probably a method called index of. This gives you the index, the position of something. So if I had an array like this and I did index of this, it would give back what index that's at. That being said, it would probably be a little bit more complex than that, because each item in the array would have to hold both the name and the points of a person, which means you need to be putting custom objects in there with a name and a points property. And that means getting index of to actually compare what you're looking for against what's in the array properly might not work, because index of 
basically uses dash eq inside. It goes through everything in the array and compares it to what you give it and tells you what position that thing is at. And as we know, dash eq on custom objects just gives false unless they are the exact same object in memory. And if you had the exact same object in memory, then you wouldn't be trying to find it. So that's not really very helpful. So trying to do this with arrays would be possible, but it would definitely be a bit of a pain. You'd have to set up your own for each for it to compare and things. So doable, yes, but very awkward. Thankfully though, it will be a lot easier and just more performant to just use a hash table, which is literally designed for accessing by key, while an array is just designed to hold items. So we're going to hold all the people we've added in a hash table and the key on each item will be the person's name and the value will be that person's points. Alright, I think that could work. So now that we've thought through a little bit, we have an idea of roughly what we're looking for, let's now actually put the script together. Alright, so let's start with the menu. Now there's one interesting thing I noticed before we even write the menu is that it keeps repeating again and again, just infinitely, it just keeps on repeating. So how can we do that? How can we repeat code? Well, we can do that using a loop, and we just learn about the while loop. And we need to somehow make this loop keep on going infinitely. The easiest way is to make a condition that's always going to be true. So you might think, okay, so let's just do 2 equals 2. That will always be true, so the loop will always keep repeating, because loops repeat as long as the condition is true. And yeah, that will work. This will repeat forever. An even better way you could do this is you could literally just write true. Remember, all a condition is, is just a boolean, and PowerShell checks that condition each time. And if it's always true, it's always going to repeat, so this works as well. Now comes the menu. So I'm just going to put a whole bunch of write outputs to print all of this out. So there's all that stuff we need to print out. And now we need to get them to actually choose one of the items. We can do that with a read host here, giving them the prompt. And now what we want to do is depending on the choice they entered, so an if, we're going to do different things. If they entered 1, we'll do something. If they enter 2, we'll do something else, and so on, all the way up to 4. So, so far, the script is coming together really nicely now. Now, I'm using ifs here, and that's fine. We don't need else if or anything like that, because, well, it can't ever be 1 and 2 at the same time, or anything like that. So we don't have to worry about multiple conditions running. However, it is quite common for people to use else if for things like this, and it doesn't have any effect functionally, it will still behave the same. But because it can never be two of these at once, if we know it's one, there isn't really any point in checking if it's two, you're just making the computer do more work for no reason. And that's why in general you'll see chains like this represented as else if, even when functionally, yeah, it would still work with just plain ifs. So we'll make all these else ifs because that's really what people will usually do. Also a benefit of doing it like this is you can add an else to the end to print some message if it's none of these. Without the else ifs, it would instead be only when it's not for would it print this message, which would basically mean for all of these it would say invalid input. So else if is necessary for that. Alright, so let's write the code to go in the first option now. What we want to have happen when you choose one. This is the option to add someone. So all we'll do is we'll ask for the name of that person. And then we need to add this person to our hash table, our collection of people. We haven't actually made that yet, so let's just go up to the top, let's save above the while loop, and set the variable people to a new hash table. And we can just make a new hash table like this, that'll be fine. We don't want to do this in here, because then it would make a brand new hash table every single time the while loop goes around, and you'd lose all the people in it. So just doing it at the top here, to set up this hash table when you start the script, is fine. And now we need to add this new person they chose to the hash table. Now, how do we do that? Well, we can't use plus equals, because if you remember, that only works on arrays, and this is not an array. However, there is a method on hash tables we can use. If we just hop into PowerShell, let's make a hash table like so, and let's use getMember to have a quick look at the methods on this hash table. Alright, so here we are, and if you look through here, there's a whole bunch of methods to let you remove things and all sorts, but the one we want is the add method. And if we go over here, you can see that it takes in the key as the first parameter, and the value as the second parameter, and they can be anything. So in our people hash table, the key represents the person's name, 
and the value is how many points that person has. So when we go to add a new person to that hash table, the key we want to give that is the name we entered here. And the value, the number of points we want to give them, well, that's up to you. How many points do you want a person to start off with? You could have another read host to ask for that, but we'll just use zero here. So every person starts off with zero points. And that is that option done. Let's move on to adding a point to a person. So what we do is we ask who they want to add points to, like so. And now we need to get this person in the hash table with this name the user entered. And we need to add one to the value there. To do that, what we're going to use is the indexer, the square brackets, to get the value that goes alongside the key for what we entered here, just like so. So we tell the hash table to find the item with this key. Whatever the user entered, whatever's in this variable, we're going to find. And that will give us the value there. That's what the square brackets on the hash table do. You give it the key, it gives you the value. And all we need to do is take that value and add one to it, just like that. And that will do the trick. And we'll copy and paste this and do the same for removing an item. Except there, we're going to subtract one. And now the final part is to print out all the people. That's not really very hard. All we need to do is just hand our hash table to format table and leave that to get printed out. And there it is in all its glory. That is how you make the script and that is the end of this extremely long episode. This practical stuff really does take some time, huh? Anyway, we haven't got too much left to cover, so stay tuned for some more episodes in the future. In the description, you'll also find some ways we could improve this script, because there are definitely ways that we could improve it. And with that said, I will see you all next time. Bye.